Uh, he and I think is the fourth club of Rotary that was ever established. They're a little little bigger than us by a factor of ten. <laughs> <laughs> so he can probably go back and show how the guys and the, the bumpkins in the country do when he gets back to the big city. Uh, David uh, Brooker is the uh, gratitude guy. David has been a speaker, teacher, life coach, best-selling author for over uh, 25 years. Having uh, suffered multiple personal issues and family tragedies, he has found the tools and techniques to bounce back from any of life's setbacks. He, is, he specializes in teaching people the benefits of uh, living a life of gratitude. One of those things, he, he'll be real happy when I finish with this introduction. <laughs> he will tell you about that. And specifically, uh, the advantages of using uh, a daily gratitude journal. As the author of the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, happiness and, and uh, happiness starts with gratitude and gratitude nuggets to chew on, David will show us the transformation, transformative uh, power of gratitude. He was recently featured on New Day with Margaret Larson on King TV and chat with the women on KIXI radio. With over 300 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, 35,000 viewers have uh, seen his message and he is now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. Please uh, welcome uh, David Brooke. Thank you, Dr. I'll get this stuff out of your way. Thank you, Bucky. And I also, I know she had to leave. I wanted to thank uh, Joan for inviting me. I'm always very, very grateful. That's probably a big surprise about um, people inviting me. I'm, I'm blessed enough to do two or three talks a week. And just as recently as a year ago, I was talking once or twice a month. So uh, let me first start off by a show of hands. How many here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? I speak, thank you. I speak to groups that go from 15 or 20 up to a couple hundred, a thousand. It's always about 75, 80 percent of the group that raises their hand. And what somebody pointed out to me one day, it's not just personal loss. What happened in 2008 and 2009 and since, it's lost businesses, 401ks, homes. There's been a lot of very, very traumatic things that have happened to a lot of people. So let me tell you what happened to me. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked over in bed and my wife wasn't there. Uh, that's odd. Dana's usually there. And I couldn't figure out where she was, so I got out of my bed and I walked towards the room. And Connor, who was four at the time, comes over and goes, where's mom? And I go, I don't know. And just as we walk down the hallway, my 14-year-old, Kyle, says the same thing. I don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms and we walk down the stairway and we look down in the washroom, or the laundry room rather, and she's lying face down in front of the washer and dryer and she's kind of all slumped over. So we go rushing down there and flip her over and the stuff's coming out of her mouth. It didn't look good. Connor starts crying and said to Kyle, go call the fire department, go call the medics. And within a matter of minutes, there was probably 25 people in our house. They took her out in the rec room and they had all those tubes and wires and those paddles, just like you saw on TV. It was the most surrealistic thing I'd ever dealt with. Her, her chest is bouncing up from those paddles and things. And for those of you who have ever been through something like this, time loses all measure. You have no idea how much time has gone by because your body goes into shock and you're kind of numb because of what's happening. So this little short fire lady comes over to me and says, uh, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half, and we still have no heartbeat. Would you like us to continue? And I sat there and I thought to myself, never before in my life had I had, had, I had to make a life and death decision for somebody. And I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old. And what made it so particularly tough for me, and Bucky alluded this a little bit in my uh, bio. It wasn't just my wife that had died. I'd already lost my father to suicide. He was a very prominent attorney in Seattle. My mother had died of cancer. When I graduated from Queen Anne High School, my best friend and his brother were killed the night we graduated on Dexter. 
and it just went on and on and on. And over time, I watched so many people pass away. What was so unbelievably sad is half of them were from their own hand. Dana had died of a prescription pill overdose. In fact, Bucky, you were mentioning Everett. It was Everett Providence, I think, is where she had gone for her addiction problem because she'd been hooked on Vicodin and Oxycontin. And we met at Nordstrom. We were both working there and so forth. And I remember, in fact, paying attention to the people here, like Bruce, for instance, in law enforcement. She got arrested for prescription fraud. Fire department. Oh, sorry. I didn't, sorry, I didn't notice that. Sorry, Bruce. He's not sensitive about it. Yeah. So, okay, and that concludes my talk. Thank you so much. But I'd never seen somebody like this before. I just hadn't. And so many things happened that were just so out of the realm of what I understood. And what I realized is that two or three days after Dana had passed away, I realized how much how shock works. And I walked up to the deck and I stood out there and I looked up at the sky and I thought to myself, now I see why people kill themselves. Because I've been through too much stuff and I don't think I can do this. And I literally grabbed my hand when I'm just flesh and bone and cartilage and you know, bone and a few things. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Connor couldn't stop crying. Where's my mom? Kyle was, was a little older, so he approached it a little bit differently. But I remember what the Dr. Dickinson said at this Everett Clinic when Dana had gone in for this prescription addiction. And he says, come on in here, I want to talk to you. Are you David Brooke? Yep. Are you Dana's husband? Yep. And he points out in the room where a bunch of these people are. And they try to make you feel better. See him? He's an attorney. They're an, that's an uh, architect. That's a doctor. But all I cared about is the blonde woman over there that was my wife that was struggling with this Vicodin and Oxycontin junk. And he said, I need, I need to let you know what you're up against. I've been doing this for 35 years. One. One in 20 is all that'll make it back to normal life. Of the 19 that don't, half of them will be dead within a year. And she passed away about six months later. So I really started thinking, I'm a pretty positive guy, but I'd taken so many punches to the gut that I thought, it just kind of depends on how you look at something. And you can all decide. We've all heard of the glass half full and half empty. So I'd like you to all stand up for a second, if you would, and just extend your right hand. I took my watch off, so I'm going to keep track of time. And I'd like you to turn it in a clockwise manner. Now, if anybody needs a reference, here's a clock up here. So this is clockwise. And just keep turning it clockwise, a nice little tight circle. Now just start to slowly bring it down. Keep it clockwise. Slowly bring it down to your head. Eyes, chin, and put it about your waist. Now which direction is it going? Connor, who said that, Bruce? With the fire department. Okay, you can sit down. The chief. The chief. As I say, that concludes my remarks. I'm <laughs> I've had some very, very smart guys I've known, PhDs and master's guys that have said to me, so how does that trick work? I said, what trick? Well, do people actually change? I said, no. It's, it depends on how you look at it. It's above or below. So I started thinking about, I'm going to have to find something. But before I got to what I was going to find, I had to realize that you just can't give up on stuff. And I'm listening to everybody here, and I, I pay really close attention. you got to be Doug, right? Is it Doug? That's Doug. You're John? Lee. Lee, oh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> that blew that whole thing. And then Phil, is it Ethan and Ryan? Maybe because I want him to tell a story about that, and that's Eric and Casey, and you know, and you try to really Jody. You just try Chris right there. You just try to pay attention, but it takes as long as it takes. And I realize I'm 63. I thought I was going to be done with life. I thought I was going to be retired, living on a course like here. It didn't work out that way. But I noticed Connor when I noticed Ethan and Ryan. Connor really, really struggled. And about a month after, actually about six months after Dana died, the people in kindergarten said to me, "He's really behind." And he did all these assessment tests, and then they were done with them. They had him wait in the car, and they told me, he's messed up. He's going to be screwed up for life. Occupational therapy, all this kind of stuff. They had him bouncing balls and everything. I said, his mom just died six months ago. What do you expect? Ah, yeah, well, that's kind of, you know. And so I sat there, and the final thing I said to her, as I said, well, you know, we live by Green Lake. And I said, I, went to, I was going to go to have Connor go to Roosevelt. I said, I was a pretty decent athlete. And I said, he's going to be a quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. And she started laughing. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's going to be messed up his whole life. 
And I went back out in the car and did about the only thing I could figure out to do. I just couldn't stop crying. Kept saying, why are you crying? He's like five now because he was about four, four and a half when Dana died. He said, don't worry about it. But he continued to struggle. And I watched him. And that's why I was paying attention to Ethan and Ryan because he, he tried to play baseball. He couldn't play baseball. He couldn't catch. He couldn't hit. He couldn't throw. He kept going through coach pitch, t-ball. I mean, t-ball. The ball doesn't move. It just sits on the tee. So he'd swing up here. They go, no, no, Connor. Here's the ball right here. For those of you that are parents and you know. And then he'd hit the tee. The ball would dribble off. And he'd go, I got to hit. I go, no, Connor, you have to hit the ball. But he kept trying. And so he'd go out and strike out. And the pitch was here. And he'd swing here. He'd go back in the dugout and put his hands in the dugout. And just ball. I couldn't go grab him. And I couldn't embarrass him in front of his friends. So I just sat there and went through this year after year. And then finally we get to this game on May 31st, 2005. He doesn't play much. And they're down 7-6. to six. It's the bottom of the 7th. And there's two outs. And there's guys on 2nd and 3rd. And I'm just kind of enjoying the game because he's not playing. And who comes out of the dugout? It's Connor. And he's, he's up. And so I do the only thing that seemed logical. How about a walk? <laughs> Maybe a, a hit by a pitch. Just, Lord, please. And again, those of you that are you know, it, it's a struggle. But I'm just sitting there as best I can. Ball one, strike one, ball two, strike two. Full count. The next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third baseline, just inside the bag, goes into left field. The guy from third comes in. The guy from second comes around third. Here comes the ball, the guy, the catcher. They all meet at the plate. The guy catches it. They crash down. The ball pops out. They win the game 8-7. to seven. And Connor, I can remember it like two minutes ago, is standing out on second base, just like this, the entire dugout, heads out, puts them on their shoulders, carries them off the field. I had such a lump in my throat, I couldn't talk for an hour or two. But we got home that night, and I sat him down in the bed, knowing that everything he'd been through and I'd been through and Kyle had been through. I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. I said, you never gave up. It's about never giving up. And he went on, he just graduated from Bothell High School, he went on to become the starting pitcher, one of their best players. But he never gave up. And I watch so many people that give up all the time. So I, was, I could see how easy it was to give up. And it doesn't matter what age you are. You can always turn over a new leaf tomorrow. So this buddy of mine says to me one day, you ought to get a gratitude journal. I go, what's that? How many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Wow, that's pretty good. How many have ever heard of a journal? <laughs> How many have ever seen a journal? That's everybody, thank you. But I realized I was going to need something, and I said, so, what? so I go to Amazon, and I order a gratitude journal, because that's what he told me to do, and I get it, and I put it on the shelf, and I just look at it for three months, which is just idiotic. And I realized that you might want to try this. So I started writing in this gratitude journal, and I came up with this I've got some flyers and some books that I, I sell and so forth. But if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. And in this app world we're in now, with all these tablets and electronics devices, there's something about, I'm so grateful, this thought that starts in the CPU up here called our brain, goes to our heart, our arm, our pen, our hand, and writes on something. I'm so grateful I had a chance to meet Bucky and hear about Alaska. It doesn't matter what it is. And there's something about the way that plants it in your brain. It's the same reasons why we take notes in high school and college. And we can go back and refer to it and so forth. Eventually I got into it and I actually made a journal myself. And this takes seven and a half minutes a day to write in. And all you do on this is I have a little deal here. In fact, I always love to bring my own. And people will flip through it and they go, oh, you write in this every day. And they go, I hope so. I mean, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I want to practice what I preach. And it completely reframes and refocuses seven and a half minutes a day. And because so many people overdose, suicide, pills, all these different ways that people took out their own lives at all these young ages, I thought, I've got to figure out something that's going to be a coping mechanism that's healthy. Because there's a ton of deadly ones and destructive ones that are killing people every day. I read the other day in, uh, I live in Bothell, Mill Creek, North Seattle. I think it was the east side, Bellevue, Issaquah. They have these burglaries all the time now, so the cops come over there and they 
find the laptops are there and sometimes even jewelry and they can't figure out what's going on and they know what to do. They go into the bathroom and the medicine cabinets are all stripped of all the medication. And that's what people are after. And so that's what's happened. So what I tell people is that you have to have something that's going to give you that reason to want to put down everything in your life that you're grateful for. Bucky mentioned that I do a video every single day. And I do a video that has to do with gratitude. It's always two minutes. In fact, in a little bit, I'm going to just, if you guys have cards, I'll draw for a card and I'll, I'll give away a book. And I always tell people, if you want to get my video every Monday, it's 7.45 in the morning, it's a minute and a half. It's on gratitude. It's just a nice way to start the week. But people always ask me, well, how do you think of another topic? I go, seriously? I mean, you, you really think I'm going to run out of things to be grateful for? I mean, my gosh, I mean, I, I just have this picture. Where's Brooke? He's at Starbucks. He's just sitting, staring at the sea. He ran out of ideas. He can't do anything. He just has a latte. He can't think of anything else to be grateful for. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. So one day it was, uh, I did one on the furnace. It was freezing out. And I thought, I'm so grateful for my furnace. It's just chugging away down there, keeping us nice and toasty and so forth. And you see people that are less fortunate than we are. And it makes such a big difference. So... I ask people all the time, uh, again, Bucky, very thank you so much for that nice introduction. I'm fortunate enough to be on the radio and TV, and they always come down to one thing. Is there one message? Is there one thing that you could, we could take away from this, from what you've done? And I, I know it doesn't have to be my journal. I said, get a gratitude journal. Try it and see. Because people are always finding out that there's different ways that people are coping. I can't believe I'm 63. It's gone by very, very fast. And I just had another big use for this. See, that was Bruce that said he's got a year to pay off the, the last Chapman College, right? I took Connor down to San Diego a week ago Saturday and, and dropped him off for school. And it has been just brutal because he and I were like this after everything we went through. I mean, I, 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 I'm embarrassed, man. I guess I'm a crier. Once we got to the airport, his buddy and his buddy's father and I said all goodbye and went, I, just, I just started crying. I couldn't stop crying. We've been so close. Well, guess what came to the rescue again? When you start reframing and refocusing how grateful I am that he survived Dana's loss, the same thing for Kyle, and has done very well and got to go down to school in San Diego and works hard and got a job with Costco and then found a Costco down there where he could switch roles with a guy. How grateful I am. I'm going to miss him, but how grateful I am for that. Because again, looking at uh, Ethan and Ryan, you want him to be happy and healthy and self-sufficient. And self-sufficient is a big, big part of that. So I realized that this thing was another tool that I used because, again, I've seen so many people that have died at such a young age and so on. So it was really something I felt very passionate about. And I will tell you this, too. I'm fortunate enough to do workshops. And people will say, well, I'm going to come to your workshop. I'm going to buy your book, whatever. But I've just noticed over time, ever since Dr. Dickinson said 1 in 20, it just, that's 5%. It just seems to be the case. Well, what should I do, Dave? Buy a book. Buy this book. I'll tell 20 people, one person will buy it. And I thought about this gal that worked for me years ago named Tracy. And I was talking about this 1 in 20 a long time ago. Are you going to be the one? And I could look at every one of you and go through. I didn't get all the names. Evan, Eric. I mean, I got, I got a lot. I just try to just pay attention and see who's Jody I mentioned. And Is that John? Who's next to you, Jody? Yeah. Jim. Thank you. Anyway, just to make the point, if you focus and you pay attention, but here's a book you can get, not mine, just any book. So this gal Tracy was working with me, she goes, I'm going to be the one, I'm not going to be the 19. She was so proud of it. And uh, then she gets pregnant by some yahoo. And she goes, i got to move to Texas to have my baby. But I want you to know, I'm going gonna, gonna to make you proud. So she leaves and goes to Texas, and I kind of forget about her, frankly. About a year later, I get a call from her. Dave, it's Tracy. And she goes, I just want you to know. I made you proud of me. I'm going to be the one. I'm not, I was the 19. I'm not one of the 19. I said, what happened? She goes, well, I had my baby. My mom helped me. I said, fantastic. What's his name? And his name was Jimmy or something like this. And she says, uh, I got a new man in my life, too. Phenomenal guy. I said, great. What's his name? And his name was Bob. So what's the logical question? So what's Bob do? Well, he's on work release right now. And I can still remember thinking, Tracy, is that really the way to turn your life around? I should find out someday what she's doing to find out. But it makes such a difference to ask yourself that question. And if you need a healthy coping mechanism, consider gratitude and consider a gratitude journal. 
all the time with our media and everything you get, we are constantly told what we don't have. And when you focus, when you focus on what you have versus what you don't have, it reframes and refocuses your, your mind in such a different manner. So at this time, do you guys want to grab cards? Can I give away a book? Do you guys have business cards? I will be happy to give away a book. And Mr. Bucky, can you? Oh, and then one quick thing. I do do this video. If you don't want the video, just put an X on your card or don't put a card in there. But um, I love to give away a book. And uh, I've got a couple. And then the gratitude journal as well. Anything that we'll... Uh, as I said, I like to say, a lot of people like that video, so if you don't want it, just put it on there. And as Bucky is getting those, I do, as I said earlier, a lot of talks. I'm very, very blessed to be invited and I appreciate it so much. The only thing I ever ask in return is if somebody wants to grab a card or a flyer, if you want to buy a book, that's great, but that's not why I'm here. And any referrals, I appreciate it so much. Uh, and I think about the impact of life. How many people here know about the starfish story? A couple people. A lot of people know about it now. Um, Sorry, I don't thank you. See you know, I'm not looking. I promise. Of course, if this is if this is the chief, I'm going to be in the Sonia. Sonia, very cool. So you can come up here. You can come up front, Sonia. So I've been fortunate enough to um, write a book. This this book is the one I do a lot for school kids, so it's a little bigger font. So don't don't be insulted. It's just. It's just, it's a nice size font. So, thank you, Sony. Congratulations. So, about a month ago, I don't think I'm anything special. I'm just trying to get this message out about gratitude. And maybe I impact one life today, and that was worth it to me more than yesterday. But this gal, kind of like Sonia, comes up, and they all clap, and she gets the book. It's a big group, and I hand her the book, and she kind of starts to walk away. And I said, hey, if you'd like me to sign it, I'll be happy to. And she, she turns around and goes, that's okay. <laughs> just walks <watch. laughs> I just went, okay. I, I think, I said, were you looking for like John Grisham or somebody? I mean, just, just a guy from Bothell, you know? It's just kind of, so. But anyway, so, but here's what I'd like to, to <laughs> okay, actually. You have to tell me twice. Okay, is it, that's what you have. Okay, may I sign it right as soon as I'm done? I'll bring it back to you. Thank you, Sonia. And did you get the 20 bucks that I gave you for that? Thank you. When I'm fortunate enough to do workshops, I kind of break it down into five pieces. Try, try gratitude. Try embracing gratitude. You don't have to, but I'm just telling you it saved me and it worked for me. Number two, understand it takes as long as it takes and you can never, ever, ever, ever give up. That's Winston Churchill. If you can get a gratitude journal and use something to write in every day, whether it's mine, whether you do, you would just put notes, anything, try it. Because again, we're just bombarded with negative messages every single day. And the final thing is, is sharing gratitude. Anything in your life you've ever been excited about, have you noticed how you shared it with other people? You know, say, hey, I've got to tell you about this. This is this really cool thing or whatever. And I realized, oh, and real quickly on, this, on the starfish, for those that hadn't heard that, two guys are walking down the beach and here's the, the sand and here's the ocean and they're walking right along the water line and it's high tide and just thousands of starfish are up here and the sun's just crisping them, just hitting them, frying them. So they're walking along, this one guy's just talking away. The one guy reaches down and grabs a starfish. His buddy goes, whoa, what are you doing? He goes, hang on. He grabs a starfish. What are you doing? He goes, he goes, what are you doing? What difference does it make? And he cracks it like this. He goes, it'll make a difference to this starfish. And out it goes into the water. He couldn't save them all, but if he made a difference to that one starfish. And that's what will happen when you embrace gratitude and then you share it with other people. There's always something better about sharing things. It makes such a difference. Last story to leave you with. I was fortunate enough to learn how to fly a long time ago. Any pilots? Pilot? Bucky. And Jim? Lee. 
That's, how was the speaker? Uh, the names sucked, uh, remembering the names, but uh, that's only like three times for Lee. Sorry, Lee. Well, Bucky will know this then, and Lee will too. So I'm down at ocean shores, and I get caught between layers, and I'm a VFR pilot. And all of a sudden, there's clouds above and below me, and I'm going along about 150 knots, kind of along the ocean. And all of a sudden, I go, I got to get out of here. But before I can get out of here, the sun comes in from the ocean, hits these two layers of clouds, and it's just the most incredible colors I've ever seen in my life. And I'm just hanging on to the yoke, and my eyes are like, my gosh. And it was like something out of 2001, A Space Odyssey, whatever that movie was, way back when. But it was just unbelievable. Probably lasted a minute and a half. For some reason, it felt like four or five minutes. But I just, I'm going, oh, I just couldn't believe what I was watching. And I was literally frozen, and then bam! I pop out and I'm back over the sand and the, the sun's over here in the ocean. And I turn and I go, wasn't that the most incredible? Did you see the colors? That was the greens, the blues, the reds, the purple. It was just unbelievable. And I go, oh, I was flying by myself. <laughs> and I thought, wow, nobody else, nobody else ever got to see that. So it does come back to how you look at your life from up or down, going clockwise or counterclockwise. It comes back if you can make a difference to that one starfish and if you're going to share it with somebody else. And when you get back in those cars today, pay attention to your windshield. It's about two feet deep. It's about four feet wide, five feet wide, whatever it is. Pretty good size. And then notice the rear view mirror is about like this. I'd say that's about a hundred to one ratio. Remember that with your life. Mostly pay attention to what's in front of you. Keep an eye on what's behind you especially if it's like flashing blue lights or something <laughs> and you got to pull over. But that's what's really going to direct you is going forward, being grateful, it takes as long as it takes and sharing it with other people. It completely transformed my life, changed it and really in so many cases saved it. And it can save yours too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bucky. Thank you, David. You bet. So, great presentation. Uh, we're happy you're here, and uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll get Sonia. Yeah, and I'm gonna give one to Lee just on purpose. <laughs>